of Fiant Saga Radio. Ah, guys, before we move forward, we do have to remind everyone that this show is brought to you by FightSaga.com. Guys, for all the latest boxing news, please visit FightSaga.com on the daily. And ordinarily, I'd be joined with my brother, Rodney Green, but it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, brother, and many pleasant returns. Um, so I'll be doing this brief little rant by my lonesome once again. And once again, guys, I, I I don't necessarily like going off, but sometimes it's deserved. In this situation, it's a lot more uh, painful for me to actually go in on someone who is a genuinely good guy, right? Um, and I'm referring to Mr. Showtime, Sean Porter. But I'm going to go off on him because he's delusional, He's delusional, just like a lot of overpaid PBC fighters. They, because they've been overpaid, and it's not their fault, because they've been overpaid since the uh, inception of PBC. They've been terribly overpaid. The result of, and what you're getting now, is a result of all these inflated purses. And once again, Showtime Sean Porter is a terribly nice guy. One of the best guys that you'll meet within the sport of boxing. Can't say the same for his dad, but Sean is always a good guy. So it doesn't bring me any joy to have to do this. But I'm going to because currently he's sounding like a spoiled, overpaid, prima donna. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I couldn't care less if I ever saw him in the ring ever again. And I'll explain why. And, and obviously, guys, everyone knows that he's been deemed the WBO's mandatory challenger for the current champ at 47, and that's Terrence Crawford. So <laughs> Bob Arum recently threw him out an offer of something like $1.37 million, right? And this is what Sean Porter said on his podcast last week. He stated this, quote, I'm not taking a million. I've done the best I could in sending a message to Bob Arum, and I also know people who know Bob. I've told them, please tell Mr. Arum, I don't mean any disrespect. I know he doesn't, but if you're going to lowball me, don't do it. If you feel that's how you get out of fighting me, that's weak. Don't do it. However, if you want to make the fight happen, don't lowball me. I'm worth more than a million dollars. F a million dollars. I'm going to keep it as clean as possible, but I'm not fighting Terrence Crawford for no one million dollars, end quote. Well, this is what Bob Arum said when it got back to him, what Sean Porter's comments were and what his thoughts were on the matter. When it finally got back to Bob Arum in an interview with uh, British reporter Gareth Davies, he said this, I read some place that he felt insulted. Uh, that I insulted him by only offering him a million dollars. You know, maybe I'm old-fashioned. I, I don't know why a million dollars would be an insult to anybody. He should work a deal with me. If he's not happy, work a deal with me on the upside. But right now, in this market, I'm not guaranteeing more than a million dollars. I'm just not. Not in these times. End quote. Well... Apparently, that got back to Sean Porter. So yesterday on his podcast, this is what Showtime Sean Porter had to say, former two-time welterweight champion. Quote, I've said it before, and I'm glad the word is getting back to Bob that I will not fight Terrence Crawford for only a million dollars. To keep it simple, you paid Kell Brook two million reportedly to fight Terrence Crawford. What makes Kill Brook worth more than Sean Porter? End quote. And this is once again, and you know, throughout this entire podcast, Sean Porter beats his chest and says, "Well, I know the business of boxing." I, well, obviously you don't, because what makes Kell Brook worth more than Sean Porter? Well, the WBC, the WBO bylaws. That's what. That's what makes Kell Brook. It is $2 million purse worth more than Sean Porter. You are the mandatory challenger, brother. 
which means that if you try and enforce your mandatory position on Terrence Crawford and top rank, that means by the bylaws, according to the rules, you're only entitled to 25% of the entire purse. Now, contractually obligated, Bob Barham is contractually obligated to pay Terrence Crawford $4 million per fight. And when you figure out that's 75%, and you figure out, well, 25% of that would be $1.37 million. That was the offer. Bob knows what he's doing, and he knows he doesn't. He's, he's not contractually obligated to pay Sean Porter a damn thing. If he wants the title opportunity, if he wants a title opportunity, he'll take $1.37 million. But unless he has to, he's not going to pay any more than that. Bob knows this. This is why he's refusing to pay more than a million, because he knows he doesn't have to. Now, we're going to continue because it gets even better, right? There's more. Quote, I get it. A million dollars is a lot of money. This is the problem. Like, hold on. This is the part where I take just great exception. And this is where he sounds like a spoiled, pampered, overpaid diva. Let's continue. Quote, I get it. A million dollars is a lot of money for a lot of people. But when you've been in this sport as long as Sean Porter. Now, once again, that's a huge red flag when these idiots start referring to, to themselves in the third person, right? So let's continue. <laughs> but when you've been in this sport as long as Sean Porter, and when I've been able to make the amount of money that I've been able to make, I understand the business of boxing at this point, and I understand that even to begin negotiations at $2 million is an insult. Everyone knows that the welterweight division is the hottest division in boxing, and if anything, second to heavyweight, but the welterweights, we command a lot of money and command a lot of attention, and this fight will do all that and more. It'll do all that and more. Because now he's fighting Sean Porter, and I am a pay-per-view draw. To say that $1 million isn't chump change, well, it's not to a lot of people, but to Sean Porter, it is chump change, and it's insulting. End quote. Oh, boy. I don't even know where to begin with this last statement. First of all, on what planet, brother... Since when is Showtime Sean Porter a box office draw or a pay-per-view draw? When has Sean Porter even been the A-side? When he fought Adrian Broner several years ago, they had to stage the quote-unquote Battle of Ohio in Las Vegas because he couldn't even sell out venues in Cleveland or Cincinnati. And that was opposite a decent draw like Adrian Broner. The sad reality is, Sean, you guys have been severely overpaid since the dawning of PBC. But that's over now. You guys went through over $300 million in roughly two years. And it's over. PBC is solely dependent on the bankroll of Showtime Sports and Fox to guarantee their purses. And now they won't do it without the added revenue stream of pay-per-view. And why? Because they're not seeing any decent return in terms of ratings. So it's like, well, we're not going to guarantee these inflated purses without pay-per-view. And Heyman, he doesn't give a shit about the health of the sport. He's an advisor first and foremost, so his priority is getting his clients paid and the health of the sport a very, very distant second. That's the reality. That's the business of boxing, Sean. You understand the business of boxing, brother? So rather than adjusting their purses to meet market demand during a pandemic, during a boxing bear market and pay-per-view, rather than doing that, they're expecting fans to pay for these matchups that really have no business being on pay-per-view. And then this guy wants to brag to the fans that a million dollars is chump change? Oh, a million dollars is chump change and insulting to Sean Porter. Man, get the F out of here, brother. Jeez, and it gets worse. 
it gets worse, guys, if you can believe that. Right? It gets worse. He then goes on to try and grab sympathy from the hardworking men and women who currently fund his efforts. Right? He tries to get sympathy from Joe Paycheck. Quote, first of all, have respect for these fighters in the ring. That's what these fans and boxing writers need to do for the fighters. Y'all need to say more prayers for us, look out for us, look forward to us entertaining y'all more than looking at our resumes and how much money we've made or should make or who we should be fighting against, end quote. Brother, when you're expecting the fans to foot the bill for your fights, well, you better answer. Like this is, and once again, this guy knows nothing about the business of boxing because the very first, the pinnacle rule of the business of boxing is that the fans are the real bosses of the sport. Sean, the fans are the real bosses of boxing. And he beats his chest like he knows the business of boxing, trying to talk down to the fans. It, he, it goes even further, right? Quote, un, here, here goes, quote, when we get in the ring, it's literally war. It's war in the boxing ring, and these people need to understand it and respect it. End quote. Okay. So in other words, Sean Porter is saying that his life and his health is worth a lot more than the brave young men who are currently fighting at the club level and only get paid 250 to 500 dollars per round. That's what you're saying, right, Sean? That we need to understand and respect the fact that you value your health and your life and it's ultimately worth more than the hardworking, brave young men who are taking punishment for our entertainment at the club level and only getting paid 250 to 500 dollars per round. It's sickening. Once again, per the business of boxing, Sean, it's all about demand and how much money is available pertaining to your respective market value or the value of the matchup. Because I know you don't think your life is worth more than these brave young men and women who are fighting at the club level and the intermediate level who don't get paid diddly, who wouldn't say a million dollars is insulting. So it goes even further, guys. Here, listen to this. Quote, I'm starting to love the business of boxing, and it's making it more fun for me. I'm more involved now, which I really appreciate. So I implore and advise more fighters who see this pod or visit, you see my video and listen to this podcast to start learning more about the business of boxing. End quote. Jeez. Look, memo to Sean Porter. There's a lot more to the business of boxing than receiving inflated purses and self-promotion. Brother, if you really understood the business of boxing, you would understand that the sport is currently in transition and we need more big-time matchups on regular network or subscriber TV. Because guess what? If you look at the numbers for the pay-per-views that took place in 2020 during the pandemic, the numbers are abysmal. Okay? When a fighter demands more money than what's available or what exceeds their current market value or demand, networks won't pay for the matchups without the added revenue stream of pay-per-view. It's done out of necessity, not because you deserve it, And what does that do? Well, it consequently obscures the event from many mainstream or casual audiences. In other words, John, no fighters are going to pick up any new fans that way. In case you think I'm wrong, why don't you ask the Charlos? Have they gained any more popularity or picked up any new fans after their pay-per-view debut? You remember them beating on their chest? Oh, we're pay-per-view stars now. Oh, we're Lions only. We're pay-per-view. 
Dude, after only pulling in 68,000 purchases, no one saw that fight. And, Sean, I'm sorry, but your fans, the guys who are currently supporting you and most PBC fighters, they're not purchasing these events, brother. You can't tell me only 68,000 people, right? You only have 68,000 fans. Only have 120,000 fans. No, you... Boxing has a lot more than that. What they're doing is illegally streaming these events. So if you want to make a difference, you want to actually give the network some return, you want to actually provide good ratings so maybe you can get some corporate sponsorship, start demanding to your advisor, Mr. Al Heyman, that you want to be featured on regular network Fox or regular subscriber Showtime. It's the only way you're going to pick up new fans. Or maybe he doesn't care anymore. Because Showtime Sean Porter is in the twilight of his career. He's already 33 years old. How much more time does he have left? Is this the real reason why you're espousing all of this rubbish? That's what it is, brother. So if you want to make the claim and beat your chest that you understand the business of boxing... Well, then learn more about the business of boxing, because right now, yeah, it's turned into a fringe pastime in America. And without the live gate, and without anyone purchasing any pay-per-views, yeah, no one's seeing your events, and no one's even paying for them. So let's go to plan B, shall we? Unfortunately, um, fortunately for the sane members of the boxing community, Hall of Fame promoter, Bob Arum, he gets it. He's trying to keep these matchups off pay-per-view, and he wants to feature them on flagship ESPN or maybe ESPN Plus, which is only five ninety nine and has almost eleven million subscribers. Right? You know, ask Al Heyman to feature these on regular subscriber Showtime which has, I think, it's up to 27 million subscribers worldwide, right? DAZN, they understand that the pay-per-view platform is limited now, and it's an antiquated method of showcasing these big-time matchups. So they're completely the subscriber method, right? They have only right now, I think they have up to maybe a million subscribers, Because if you don't, and you don't show Showtime some return on their investment, well, they're going to do what HBO did and back out of it. HBO has over 40 million subscribers worldwide. Right? Over 40 million subscribers. And they're not spending a dime on the sport. So these fighters, if they want to stay relevant or be involved or stay active, they'd better get with the stick. Because no one is paying for pay-per-view fights any further. So if you don't care about the health of the sport or understand the business of boxing, then who cares? Then, then you might as well just retire. At this point, let them, let them just turn down a million dollars since it's insulting to them, right? You think Virgil Ortiz thinks that a million dollars and a shot at a major world title is insulting? How about Jerron Ennis? Think Jerron Ennis views a million dollars and a shot at a major world title against Taron Crawford is insulting. Okay, so if you don't want it, just shut up about it, step aside, and leave room for the hungry young fighters who want a shot at greatness. Not some tired old has-been that can't draw, can't sell out my living room on a Saturday night. And that's the end of that. That's all I have to say about that, guys. <laughs> Jeez, I tell you what, man. And once again, it, it, I, I hate doing that because Sean is a, is a good guy. He's just terribly misinformed. And he wants to insult fight fans by talking this rubbish. Well, a million dollars might be something to, to a lot of people, but it's insulting to Sean Porter. Yeah, keep on referring to yourself in the third person, brother. You're sounding a lot like Keith Thurman right now. 
And you're going to be just as active as Keith Thurman if you keep this up. Well, anyway, I'm only going to devote a couple of minutes on the arbitration news, right, of Deontay Wilder. Um, I went on, off on him terribly last week, so I'll keep it short, right? Apparently, it's been reported that Deontay Wilder and his advisor, Shelly Finkel, are going to seek arbitration um, to try and uh, either get some kind of cash reward or maybe get options on a third fight somewhere down the road in 2021 or 2022, right? But in my opinion, they're wasting their time and they're wasting a lot of money and it's just a it just doesn't make them look very good. Look, I mean, here's the difference, guys, also between a mediator and an arbitrator, right? Mediation and arbitration. Medi- mediation, a mediator is just going to be a neutral party that tries to encourage both parties to find a happy medium or come to some kind of diplomatic agreement, right? And it doesn't mean one party has the edge over another. It's This is... In most fight contracts, it's a clause that says if there's a difference in trans in how the contract is translated or interpreted, then it's settled through mediation or arbitration. And these clauses are placed in each and every fight contract to try and avoid the high costs and the time the terrible time restriction of litigation, right? Because these gangs could drag out for months, maybe even a year, maybe years, right? If it decides, if one party decides to sue. Well, mediation failed because Fury is absolutely refusing to fight Deontay Wilder at this point because of all the slanderous, disgusting things that he said, right? So now Finkel and Deontay Wilder are trying to push for arbitration, So what that means is, and usually uh, the difference between arbitration and mediation, arbitration is usually ruled on or heavily, um, uh, heavily, I guess, decided by a retired judge at times, maybe a current judge. um, But this actually gets a ruling and a very strong recommendation in case the party once again, the disgruntled party once again decides to go to suit. So whatever the arbitrator rules on, well, it has a lot of influence in what the judge ultimately will see and rule on if this goes to court, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So a couple things don't um, bode well for Team Wilder, and they're wasting their time in my opinion, right? One... Guys, you were already given dates, okay, and, and you passed those. There were recommended makeup dates, and he let those he let those elapse. Okay, first of all, this is a stale dated expired contract, and then you were given dates to try and make up for the pandemic, and given a ninety day allotment, right, extension. And you failed to act on it. So in my opinion, no arbitrator is going to rule in favor of Deontay Wilder. Especially when you consider that no one made any money off this event except for Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury. They're the only people who were in the black. According to Bob Arum. He stated, oh, this event lost money. Because of the hefty purses, both fighters being guaranteed $25 million. Um, and the high cost of promotion, how much money was spent on the promotion of this event. We had to make at least $1.2 million purchases on pay-per-view domestically in order for us to even break even. Well, it didn't do that. It did maybe between what eight hundred and twenty five to eight hundred and fifty thousand pay per view purchases in the US. So when an arbitrator considers <laughs> that Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury were the only parties that made money 
on this deal. And both Fox and ESPN lost millions. Then yeah, there's no way any arbitrator is going to feel any have any kind of sympathy for Deontay Wilder. And unless there's some kind of personal guarantee um, holding Tyson Fury liable for any monetary damages, then why on earth would Tyson Fury have to pay Deontay Wilder anything if the contract is expired and stale dated? Brother, you're living in fantasy land. Ching out these fighters, man. I swear. But hey, there's Shelly Finkel, man, looking for a dime. Looking to actually make some money off of his biggest client currently. That's what he does. It's what he's always done, being an advisor. He's just a squirrel looking for a nut, brother. But so, sorry, Wilder fans. And, and you know, and it's funny. All of these um, kind of racist YouTube pages that are just fanboy sites that are all over Deontay Wilder's nutsack. Claiming, oh, Tyson Fury has to pay Deontay Wilder $32 million. Oh, my gosh. You guys are living in fantasy land. And once again, showing how little you guys are attached and know about the sport of boxing and the business and how it's run. Once again, how is Tyson Fury financially liable for anything if the contract is still dated and expired? Unless he's a personal guarantor, which, no, he's not. Then, no, no arbitrator is going to have sympathy for you when you were the only party that made money besides Tyson Fury in the first event. You think? (laughs) Do you think any arbitrator is going to rule that Fox and ESPN still owe you money when they lost money on the first event? When you actually failed to meet the fight deadline, the fight date deadline, and allowed it to expire. No. It's a waste of time. Look, brother, it, 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 this is what we're going to end it with, right? And it's rumored currently that they're discussing the options of maybe fighting Char- Charles Martin, former IBF titleist, one and done Charles Martin in the interim, right? That's a good matchup for you, Deontay. Go that route, brother, because you you don't need another fight against one of the elite. Okay, get a fight with Charles Martin, knock him out, get your confidence back, then fight maybe a guy on maybe the upper, maybe an, uh, a guy who actually has a chance to win, maybe like, I don't know, I don't know, maybe... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Kubrat Pulev, maybe. Maybe a guy like like uh, Huey Fury, maybe. Marius Wach, right? And if you get past those two guys, then take on someone like Alexander Povetkin or Dillian White, whoever wins that fight. And if you get past those three, brother, in 2021, then you may be ready for a shot at the unified heavyweight champion, which could be either Tyson Fury or Anthony Joshua. But until then, brother, just shut up and go back to the drawing board. That's going to just about do it, guys. (laughs) I want to thank you guys for tuning in to this special half-hour episode of Fight Saga Radio. In case you missed any part of this, you can check it out on our YouTube platform, Warwick Radio on YouTube. I just want to thank everyone for coming.